scientist was preparing an experiment that involved the use of dimethylmercury. The professor spilled a few drops of the compound on her gloved hand, but thought the latex gloves would be protective. They proved to be inadequate, and the toxin passed through the glove and was absorbed into her system. Six months later, she slipped into a coma and died from acute mercury poisoning. A young research assistant at a West Coast lab was working with a pyrophoric chemical, T-butyl lithium, dissolved in a liquid. While using a syringe to withdraw a quantity of the reagent, she apparently pulled the plunger all the way out and spilled liquid onto her synthetic sweater and gloves. Introduced to air, the liquid ignited immediately, and she sustained second and third degree burns over almost half of her body. A couple of weeks later, she died of those injuries. Two researchers lost to their families, to the world of science. As these examples indicate, laboratory hazards have the potential to be fatal. Focusing on a culture of safety and strict adherence to two OSHA standards, the occupational exposure to hazardous chemicals in laboratories and the hazard communication standards can save lives and avoid injuries. This course provides an overview of the hazards present in non-production laboratories, the standard requirements that are intended to protect you, and some basic controls that are suited for the laboratory environment. The course also raises awareness of the standard requirements for communication, exposure monitoring, medical consultation, and record keeping. Chemicals in non-production laboratories present both physical and health hazards to workers. Physical hazards threaten your safety. Health hazards are sometimes more difficult to identify immediately. Health hazards fall into two broad categories, acute and chronic. In this lesson, you'll learn more about chemical and health hazards, as well as where you can go to get more information about the chemicals you use in your lab. There are a variety of chemical properties that can lead to physical or health hazards. Flammables and reactives are most closely associated with physical hazards and corrosives and toxics with health hazards. Be aware that some chemicals, such as corrosives, fall under multiple classifications. Click each category for an overview. As mentioned, some chemicals are associated with both physical and health hazards. Corrosives are in that class of chemicals. Corrosives are strong acids or strong bases. Acids and bases are incompatible, and mixing them can result in an aggressive reaction. Avoid exothermic reactions by diluting strong acids and bases by adding them to water instead of adding water to them. This reduces the chance of splashing. You'll also want to separate acids and bases because they can generate excessive heat. Toxic substances are particularly hazardous substances that have the potential for significant injury. Some are in a select category of chemicals due to the nature of injury. Click each type of toxic substance for more detailed information. Toxic substances are particularly hazardous. Called biohazards are substances derived from organisms that pose a threat to the health of humans, animals, and or plants. Biological hazards come from a variety of sources. They include infectious agents, toxins, human blood and body fluids, organs, tissues, and cells from humans. Smallpox, AIDS, tuberculosis, and influenza are examples of the many illnesses caused by biological agents. Chemicals have physical hazards because of their innate properties. Click and drag each property or category description to the appropriate chemical category. 
If the item is placed in the correct category, it will remain in place. If it is placed in an incorrect category, it will return to the top of the page, and you can try again. Click and drag the hazard on the left to the matching statement about it. When you're finished, click the check my answer button to see how you did. The occupational exposure to hazardous chemicals in laboratories and the hazard communication standards are the primary regulations that protect you against and inform you about hazardous chemicals. The occupational exposure to hazardous chemicals in laboratories standard applies to all individuals who work in non-production laboratory environments and addresses the protection of workers against occupational exposures to hazardous chemicals. The hazard communication standard requires the development and maintenance of written communication related to chemicals, labeling, reference materials, and training. In this lesson, you'll learn more about these requirements. Standard, the Chemical Hygiene Plan, or CHP, provides prudent practices and procedures for the use of chemicals in the laboratory, including laboratory and personal protective equipment. The plan must indicate specific measures an employer will take to ensure your protection and provides for the appointment of a chemical hygiene officer to implement the plan. The CHP must include other provisions listed on your screen. Click the underlined hot words for more information about exposure controls and particularly hazardous substances. Communication standard protects you from illnesses and injuries from chemical sources by ensuring you have sufficient information to recognize, evaluate, control, and protect yourself from chemical hazards. The hazard communication standard requires that every laboratory identify hazardous chemicals in the workplace and that all chemicals meet labeling requirements. The standard prohibits removing or defacing labels or storing hazardous materials in containers that don't meet labeling requirements. Click the underlined hot word for more information on GHS. The standard requires that you be provided with information when you initially begin work in an area where hazardous chemicals are present and before beginning any assignments involving new exposure situations. Your employer must make available any and all information that allows you to safely handle hazardous chemicals. Review the specifics on your screen and click the underlined hot words for more information. that you be trained on hazardous chemicals and other substances in your workplace in a variety of areas. Your employer will determine the frequency of refresher training. Click each training area for an overview. Read the statements on the left. If the statement is true, click the box under true. If the statement is false, click the box under false. When you are finished, click the check my answer button to see how you did. Hierarchy of Controls prioritizes hazard mitigation strategies on the premise that the best way to control a hazard is to systematically eliminate it or substitute a less hazardous technique, process, or material. If elimination and substitution aren't feasible, your laboratory will implement the necessary engineering and administrative controls and determine the appropriate level of personal protective equipment PPE, you need to provide as much protection as necessary. Your responsibility is to use engineering controls, follow administrative controls, and wear personal protective equipment correctly and effectively. 
This lesson focuses on these controls as a means of protecting you from laboratory physical, chemical, and health hazards. Your laboratory has established a number of administrative controls for its operations. Administrative controls define the requirements for safe use of chemical, biohazard, and radioactive materials and provide the framework for determining the appropriate engineering and PPE controls. Administrative controls can be general policies or laboratory-specific standard operating procedures. Here are some examples of administrative controls. control and the details for your lab should be covered in the chemical hygiene plan. Safe work practices are prudent practices aimed at reducing the duration, frequency, and intensity of chemical exposure. Take a few minutes to review areas that safe work practices address. Activity to test your knowledge. Match the administrative control on the left to its description on the right by clicking the item and dragging it to the correct description. When you're finished, Click the check my answer button to see how you did. Engineering controls are built into equipment operation or instruments and require no activation from the employee. Building design, ventilation systems, fume hoods, and self-capping syringe needles are examples. Engineering controls eliminate or reduce exposure to chemical or physical hazards by different methods. It can be general or local. General ventilation serves as a source of fresh air that continuously replaces potentially contaminated indoor air. Although many laboratory buildings are designed to provide a high number of air changes per hour, General ventilation only provides protection for trace or fugitive emissions of low-risk materials. One of the most important safety devices in a laboratory is a properly functioning fume hood. It controls airborne hazards that are released within the ventilation device. A fume hood protects you by constantly pulling room air into the hood and exhausting it outside the building. If you are using any chemical in a way that could produce airborne gas, vapor, mists, dust, or fumes, the operation should be conducted in a fume hood or glove box. This will reduce or eliminate the risk of exposure by inhalation. Other local ventilation devices are designed to protect you, the product, or the environment. Exhaust from these systems should pass through scrubbers or some other treatment before being released into the general exhaust system. Click each ventilation device to learn more about it. Each of these devices has characteristics that protect you, the environment, or the substance with which you are working. Click and drag each item to the system that best serves the properties of the substance. If the item is placed in the correct category, it will remain in place. If it is placed in an incorrect category, it will return to the top of the page, and you can try again. Protective equipment, commonly referred to as PPE, provides a barrier between you and the chemicals you work with. In the hierarchy of controls, personal protective equipment is implemented last after administrative and engineering controls. While it is the least preferred method, it is just as important as the last line of defense against hazards. The specific type of PPE you wear is determined and provided by your employer based on the type and degree of hazard in both the specific operation you are conducting and the laboratory as a whole. The attributes of good PPE is that it's personal and needs to fit your specific body type comfortably so that you are not distracted by it. Lab coats and safety glasses come in many different sizes and shapes. Be 
sure to try on many to find the most comfortable for you. The most common types of personal protective equipment in laboratories are eye protection, a lab coat, and protective gloves. You may be required to wear additional PPE, such as face, hearing, head, and foot protections, as well as respirators when appropriate. In addition to wearing personal protective equipment, you must properly use and maintain it. Your employer will provide training on the use and maintenance of general and specific PPE. Practice exercise to test your knowledge. Read each item at the left. If the statement is true, click true. If it is not true, click false. When you're finished, click the check my answer button to see how you did. OSHA requires that work environments be kept free from identified health hazards and has established exposure limits called permissible exposure limits for the most commonly used industrial chemicals. Other organizations have established more current occupational exposure limits and threshold limit values for various chemicals and environmental contaminants, both regulated by OSHA and not regulated. This lesson provides awareness level information on exposure determination monitoring, and what you can expect in the way of notification, medical consultation, and record keeping. Conducts exposure monitoring at a frequency to adequately assess employee exposure. Sampling involves taking periodic, representative samples of air or dust contaminant levels using certain collection or sampling techniques, such as direct reading or swipe samples for subsequent lab analysis. Sampling occurs for a variety of reasons. The environmental health and safety personnel perform sampling periodically to confirm the adequacy of existing safeguards. Occupational health professionals, workers, and supervisors can request sampling due to a specific instance of exposure or a suspected exposure. Job hazard analysis might also indicate the need for sampling to determine whether exposure is above the action level. Your environmental health and safety personnel will notify you of the monitoring results within 15 days or according to the applicable standard. Individuals suffer hazardous material exposure exceeding an action threshold or PEL or another work-related injury. They will be offered medical evaluation at the laboratory's expense, including any follow-up examinations. Employers must also provide medical attention if employees develop signs and symptoms of exposure. An exposure monitoring reveals an exposure level routinely above the action level or if an event occurs that results in the likelihood of exposure. A licensed physician must directly supervise all medical examinations and consultations, which must occur at a reasonable time and place and without loss of pay to the employee. The examining physician, the hazardous chemical to which the employee may have been exposed and describe the conditions under which the exposure occurred. The description includes quantitative exposure data, if it's available. There should also be a description of the signs and symptoms of exposure, if the employee is experiencing any. Physicians are also responsible to communicate exam and test results, the medical condition revealed during the exam, recommendations for further follow-up, and a statement that the physician has informed the employee of the results of the consultation or exam, and any medical condition that may require further exam or treatment. The written statement cannot reveal specific finding of diagnoses unrelated to the employee's occupational exposure. In general, employers must keep worker exposure records for 30 years. This includes both monitoring activities and exposure measurements. Employers maintain records and make them available to individuals, their physicians, or their designated representatives. It's a practice exercise to test your knowledge. Read the statements on the left. If a statement is true, click true. If it is not true, click false. When you're finished, click the check my answer button to see how you did.